Uh, our next speaker, you already know who he is. He's the acting uh, undersecretary of the Navy. Uh, he's been around the town for, for years. Uh, you're among friends. Uh, there, I was looking up there, there's about 600 people. Awesome. Uh, queued in, uh, be, uh, be yourself. And um, um, between yourself about attacking the, the kind of the big pictures, what's working, what's not working, COVID-19, uh, and then the CNO and, and Drew Berger as well tomorrow. I think we will have a very strong uh, case in terms of the, um, uh, the Navy and the Marines in the uh, China fight. Sir, you have the floor. Awesome. Yes, sir. All right, team, uh, good to see everybody out there in virtual land. Uh, I, I gave Jay a heads up not to take too long smoke break. Uh, I'm not going to talk the whole time here or probably even all of the uh, 20 minutes he's, uh, he's given me because I want to I'm going to spend maximum time in the uh, McAleese mosh pit uh, and mixing it up with you guys and answering questions and kind of going where you want to go. And so uh, so please have those questions ready. Uh, I think uh, those you know me know I'm frank to a fault, and so we'll certainly try and give you the perspective. Uh, honor to be here. Uh, I, uh, and it's an honor actually to be here. You're going to hear from the CNO and Commandant uh, tomorrow, both great warfighters, and they're going to kind of put things in a warfighter lens. Uh, as they should. Uh, I'll talk a little bit here and certainly uh, focus my initial comments on what are we doing to support them, we meaning all of us uh, in industry and in academia, uh, in the government side. And uh, as you've heard me say, ultimately I measure success for all of us through the eyes of sailors and Marines. Uh, they're our ultimate customer. Our job is to deliver them the gear uh, that they need to fight and win. Uh, today and in the future, and that's, uh, I think, a, a key piece. Um, one thing, that, you know, we kind of get into a bait, the debate of current readiness versus future readiness uh, and kind of make it a sense that we can only have one or the other. And, uh, and I hope that is a false dilemma. Uh, if we've made that a real dilemma, then we have not done our job, I think, on the acquisition business uh, side of things uh, because we've got to be able to do both of them. We can't simply do one or the other. Uh, and balance is really important. And so how we balance those competing priorities, particularly in kind of today's current operations environment is really, a, really an interesting challenge uh, slash opportunity. And, uh, and so I think hopefully we'll have some discussions about that. Uh, so you know, we'll probably cover and comment on in detail, but you should know your Navy Marine Corps team is really active right now. You know, thousands, tens of thousands of Marines are forward stationed inside the first island chain as we speak. A third of the fleet is on the water sailing around the world. Uh, and as you, you know, all you have to do is pick up the news, whether it's uh, picking up uh, contraband weapons, whether it's uh, sailing South China Sea, um, up in the Arctic, uh, we're really busy. That's good, business is good. Uh, the challenge for us is then how do we sustain that and how do we grow that so we don't get caught in this false dilemma of we can either be ready today and use our readiness today or be ready for the future. Uh, and that's the job we all have to do as we're working here. If I kind of take a backward lens, uh, since the last time we got together, since the last time, you know, you've got all the great minds together here in this conference. You now it's been a interesting uh, year, uh, challenging but enlightening. Um, you've heard me talk early on about this need to have pivot speed, adaptability, uh, that kind of came out. Um, but it also showed what we're capable of when we work together as a team. Uh, the Navy about doubled the amount of money we put on contract in the last two years, about 20% more, particularly into COVID. And we did it with about 20 to 25% less contract actions. So in the midst of COVID, us being able to increase output uh, in terms of what we've been able to put in flow uh, and do it with less work is a, is a pretty remarkable uh, achievement. Uh, and as we think about uh, how we did that, you know, some great lessons. Uh, you know, folks want to applaud all the folks in uniform for their service, and we absolutely should do that every day. Uh, those women and men doing that in uniform every day, they, they deserve the best, and we should always think of them. But there was, a, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of patriots out there. We didn't shut down a shipyard for a single day either private or public during COVID. We didn't have a supplier drop out to the point where we couldn't recover and work around that in the period of COVID. And what was, I think, um, enlightening for me was when we kind of, you know, I'd say, scraped away the barnacles and got down to business, 
uh, we were able to achieve outcome in a tremendously challenging environment and demonstrate a resilience I'm not sure we even thought we had. So as I think going forward, I think a lot about two words, three words really, balance, resilience, and opportunity. And so as you'll hear from the CNO and the Commandant, as, uh, as I'm dealing with every day, keeping things in balance is really important. Uh, because if we don't, we create really brittle either organizations or operational concepts or programs. And when you have a very brittle program and the world's changing a lot, bad things tend to happen. Uh, and so we're looking for anywhere where we can re kind of retire brittleness and add resilience. So as I think about going forward, I don't want to return to where we were a year ago this time. Right? I want to take all those lessons learned, take that velocity of learning, build that resilience in. As I think about cyber challenges, I think about climate challenges, I think of competitive challenges, resilience is a, is a key element of that. Uh, second is balance. How do we keep things in balance uh, so that we've got the right industrial base that we need going forward without abandoning the industrial base we have now? How do we take advantage of the incredible power prime contractors bring, uh, as well as the incredible engineering and innovation in the smalls and get them working together on uh, not necessarily competing? How do we think about future readiness in things like remotely crewed or unmanned systems with today's uh, systems in manned? And so that word of balance uh, plays a lot on my mind. Since we can't predict the future perfectly, right, we can think of some possible futures creating programs, concepts of operations, concepts of employment that are balanced and resilient gives us the most uh, firepower for a range of potential futures. And then finally, opportunity. And bureaucracies tend to overemphasize managing downside risk and are really poor at taking advantage of upside opportunity. So how do we flip that uh, curve together so that if we have a discovery, whether it's out of a startup or out of a prime contract or IR&D or uh, you know, Jim and his brother in the garage, we know how to get that not only through the discovery phase, which we tend to be over-invested in, all the way through the deployment phase, which we have not been able to achieve at the rate we want. Lots of great, you know, Futures Command you just heard from, they're doing a lot of great things. All the services are doing uh, important things. What we have not yet achieved collectively is scale and speed. And if we're gonna compete globally, scale and speed matters. We can't just have niche demonstrations. We've gotta figure out how to do that at scale. And that's where opportunism comes in mind. And to be opportunistic, you've gotta be forward leaning. You've gotta be forward thinking. You have to have great relationships and you have to have trust. And so again, looking back on the trust we built amongst all of us, whether it's at the fleet, whether it's with industry, whether with government over the last uh, 18 months. That trust I want to use so we can increase speed and scale as we think about how to take on the challenges going forward. Um, the four key things I think I've talked about before still on my mind. Deliver. Right? We can have lots of great ideas. We can good tech demonstrations. We've got to deliver to the fleet. Whether that's getting ships in and out on time, or that's getting new construction out on time, or whether that's delivering new technology. We've got to attack fundamental cost that, do, that doesn't add value. We've got to go after those fixed costs that are eroding our buying power, whether it's our business relationship, technical debt, or, or concept of operation debt. And so I'm looking for all those ideas where we can take fundamental costs out without taking profitability uh, and, uh, and innovation out. Third, as you heard me talk a lot about, it's about innovation, pivot speed. Create a really sound foundation of execution that allows us to pivot to whatever the challenges are there. And then last, not because it's least important, but most important, which we don't talk enough about, is how do we continue to attract, uh, recruit, retain talent in our industrial base here, both on the government side and on the industry side. Because without talent, the processes don't matter. And with talent, the processes really don't matter because we'll work our way through that. And so I would encourage folks to think about all of those things as you're thinking about how to bring solutions to the Navy. I'm trying to create the surface area that makes it easy. I'm trying to create an opportunistic mindset that allows us to leverage opportunities. And then thinking a lot about pipeline to the fleet of how to take those discoveries and get them in the fleet as fast, as cheaply, and as effectively as possible. You have solutions in those spaces, 
I'm all ears literally here. So, uh, Jim, maybe with that, we can go uh, do a little uh, mosh pit Q&A. Yes, sir. All right, I'm all right, in. Let's do it. Yes, sir. Co-moderating well, today. The back of these Murphy Washington. There yes, we go. So, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to trademark can, that. Can I start? What the hell is a mosh pit? You're not that. No. We're not going to do live yeah. demonstrations, Jim. There we're going to see here. Is this is this like the soap? I'll, I'll tell you, I was pretty good in the mosh pit. You can look it up when you go. Yes, home, sir. Jim. Yes, J sir. Jim yeah. Hondo is he's yeah. a graduate of Lehigh University yeah. from Pennsylvania, yeah. a great yes, engineering school. So yeah. where yes, he did sir. ROTC. So there's plenty of mosh pits in Lehigh. In fact, my former congressional colleague and West Point professor, Tom Rooney, Congressman Tom Rooney's son is a football player now at Lehigh. So, uh, and although they come from the Steelers family, that part of the state of Pennsylvania are usually Eagles fans like myself. So, um, yes, sir. Hey, Hondo, we have a bunch of questions. Do you mind yeah, if I go right to the, right, we got, uh, we got Neil Picker from Rolls Royce, Neil, uh, you're leading off. What do you have for us? Yeah, good, 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 good afternoon, uh, gentlemen. Uh, yeah, Neil Picard calling in from the uh, Rolls-Royce Propeller Factory in uh, Walpole, Massachusetts. So it's an honor to speak to you this afternoon. Um, my question is in around the um, future of the, of the fleet size and construct. Clearly, we're still seeing a lot of uncertainty and debate over that. And... Um, you know, recent articles with regards to support or lack thereof of the inverse versus divest strategy. So how, how do you see the future force playing out? And when, when do you feel we're going to see uh, greater stability, particularly in and around uh, unmanned requirements? Over. Yeah, so a, a great question. Uh, hopefully, uh, as the budget comes out, you'll get some more uh, kind of visibility in that. Um, what I would say, it's weighing heavily on our mind and on my mind in a couple different dimensions. Um, one dimension which uh, the Navy team worked really hard at with a, with a number of you out here is, is really going after fundamental costs. So I know, you know, if you want to grow a Navy at some point, we've got to uh, understand the budget allocation. Uh, and that'll be a debate uh, at the highest levels and we'll work our way through that. Uh, I'm rightly now focused on how do we maximize uh, the output we can generate for the resources we have. And, you know, before I go shoot on somebody else's target, right. I want to make sure we're doing everything we can uh, and leveraging a lot of the things we've been learning together of how to take costs out of uh, programs, how to make smart investments uh, such as, you know, we put about $300 million of Defense Production Act money in to try and modernize and help bolster the industrial base. Uh, look, we're going to build ships. You know, with a 300-ship Navy that, you know, our average service life of 30 years, you're, you're going to have to build about 10 ships a year just to stay, stay even. The trick for us is how do we keep driving affordability so we can maximize the output for the resources we have and resist a little bit our, I would say, culture to continue to add complexity uh, and cost into a product as opposed to looking for other creative ways to get there. And, you know, we are, you know, this is a pivotal, it's been a pivotal three, four years. The next three or four years, I think, are going to set the next two to three decades. Uh, and so um, my sense is uh, everyone understands the problem. Everybody understands the complexity. Um, COVID showed us what's uh, in front of us if we can really work closely together in a trusting relationship where we hold each other accountable. Uh, now we've just got to um, get over some of those natural obstacles we place in ourselves uh, that have caused this inefficiency as we're going forward. I've, I understand the stability piece. Uh, we've saved you know, $20 billion plus in multi-year contracts to create stability. Uh, I worry sometimes stability, if left unchecked, can lead to complacency. And so that's where we've got to have the right, back to my balance word, where we've got to balance stability with, you know, you know, I'm a, Jim would probably say positively discontent person, right? We, sh we, we, you know, we're positive on the trends, but we're discontent with speed and scale. And so, Neil, you know, you've got a great workforce there. The, uh, the ideas you bring to the table to help us, uh, again, I don't want to go after a cost just by taking a percent off profit margin. I want to go after, you know, non-value added cost in our products and services. Uh, so that we can deliver more for sailors and Marines. Yeah, Hondo, there's no doubt. I mean, in your job as the, you know, I was the Undersecretary of the Army, obviously, that mm -hmm. Undersecretary of the Navy. 
you know, as a chief management officer, yep. you know, of such an incredible bureaucracy, the, the United States Navy, uh, but making sure that when you make the cuts, that those cuts aren't going to affect the return on investment of those American tax dollars. Yep. So I appreciate that. We're going to go right now to Dana Kioti Jackson from MITRE, if it's okay. All right. All right, sir. Hopefully you can hear me. Yep. Uh, I just wanted to uh, uh, say I appreciated your comments on speed at scale. And uh, on that theme, can you talk a little bit about Project Overmatch and uh, how the Navy plans to align existing programs of record uh, to support the objective there, including any changes in authorities or funding? Yeah, great question. Uh, for those who aren't tracking, um, you know, there's been a lot of, I think, a widespread um, consensus across uh, the department that getting after this how to interconnect everything and leverage the power of that interconnection will be critical uh, to the future. For the Navy, you're going to hear tomorrow from the Commandant and the CNO about, you know, distributing our force more broadly, uh, having, you know, more distributed Marines, more lethal Marines in larger numbers. Uh, that's all awesome, um, but requires us to be able to connect things. It's so important that, you know, the last time we did our approach on overmatch was in the Polaris program where we pulled up a two-star flag and made him personally accountable to deliver to the fleet. Um, I think where we are, you know, conversely maybe to some of the other services who are also doing awesome work, the Navy's had to solve some of this already. We've had integrated fires. You can't survive in the Pacific without some form of integrated fires, uh, and we've been doing that for some time. So our approach tends to be a little bit more um, practical on, we've got a lot of data links on ships, we've got a lot of uh, data links on airplanes. We've been doing this for some time, again, back to speed and scale, uh, but it's distributed amongst a bunch of different programs. Uh, each are kind of independently looked at. Right. And so the way we're ta attacking it is, uh, you know, in kind of fine Navy fashion, uh, pull somebody, make them personally accountable to deliver, and then give him the authorities to then look at all of the different things we're doing, both in current operations and with current equipment and in future uh, activities to get those aligned. We may execute those in a distributed manner, but it's gonna be under the authority and guidance uh, of that duly appointed uh, leader, which in this case right now is Rear Admiral Doug Small. Thanks, thanks, yep. uh, Secretary. Listen, we're gonna go next to uh, Richard Sorelli. Richard Sorrell. Avaco? Yes, can you hear me? We can oh, hear you. Go. I hear him. Okay. Uh, first of all, Jim McAleese, uh, I've been going to, I went to 10 of these out of the 12. One or two years I took off and retired for a while and came back. Um, and Mr. Gertz, very nice speech. I really appreciated um, your um, conversation and, and insight. Really practical. Um, you know, um, I worked with the, a lot of the tier ones, but now I'm running a, a kind of a smaller company. It's a commercial company. I invest my money, and I've been supporting the Navy since uh, 1983, so it tells you kind of what age I'm at, right? Um, but a lot of people talk about the what we have to do. I want to talk for a minute about how we accelerate and how we accelerate the how of what we do. So to the credit of the Navy, the Navy constantly plans significant capability upgrades to stay ahead of peer threats in an ever-expanding fleet, whether that's manned or unmanned ship or aircraft. But we always see the need for rapid technology insertions in all domains. So one of those linchpins that can be done is by adhering to open standards. Uh, similar, you probably know about SOSA or MOSA, these open architectures. So I come up with disruptive technologies. I'm looking for that open architecture. So my question is in line with the anticipated growth uh, and speed of the technology we need and, in, and to be able to introduce new disruptive technologies and especially commercial technologies, how is the Navy working to align those open standards, uh, those architectures in your current and planned procurements? Yeah, and that's a, a great question. And, and, you know, I think of naval power as kind of the product of capability, capacity, and availability. And back to balance, if any one of those is zero or, or you know, at a, a large, frac a large small fraction, uh, a large 
uh, detriment to the others, it will pull down the others. Right. And so in the, I couldn't agree with you more in the capability area, iteration speed, adaptability, resilience. You know, how, one way to get resilience is to be able to change really quickly based on the threat, uh, based on uh, the operational environment or based on an opportunity that presents itself. So we're trying to move there in a couple different directions. One is we've separated for the most case uh, the work to build the platform from the work that puts uh, combat systems, weapons, sensors, everything on, on those platforms. And so generally if we build a new ship, you know, 60 or 70 percent of the funds go to the shipbuilder, but we dictate what we're going to have on there for the network. We dictate what we're going to have on there for the combat system, for the sensors, for the weapons. There, therefore, we can get an economy of scale and be able to then, once we fix it in one platform, rapidly scale it across the other. So one is kind of architecturally, how do we split up the work? Now where we're really trying, I would say, to take it to the next level is in this both, how do we develop particularly software, but software and hardware with adaptability and openness in mind? Uh, and, uh, you know, it's a challenge because we've got a lot of legacy stuff that we've got to continue to support. Uh, but if you look at things that we're doing in, uh, for instance, in the Forge, as we're thinking about how to rapidly turn software in the Aegis combat system, what we've done in the submarines, um, where we, you know, turn the hardware compute about every three years and the software about every 18 months, getting that aligned is, uh, is I think, a great opportunity for us. And we're looking for great ideas where we can experiment create digital twins, you know, create both, I would say, the business, the funding, and the technical architectures, because you have to have all three. We can have uh, a great technical open architecture, but if we have no way to bring on new contractors fast, or no way to protect IP, that won't do any good. And so we're trying to work all three of those in unison. Here's where I think you guys can help me, though. A, a capability is a combination of the equipment, the training, and the tactics. And where I think for us to go to the next level is where we can instantaneously upgrade the equipment, all the trainers, and then allow tactics development to occur. I mean, in a real DevOps environment, that's kind of what's happening. Uh, and we're still a little bit in, we'll get the equipment awesome, and then in two years, we'll get the trainers done. And then in three years, we'll build the tactics, but then, the, you know, so getting that balance so that the absorption rate, you know, we think as much about how to absorb the new technology as field it is, uh, I think, an area we still have work to go and I'm looking for great ideas. But, you know, my favorite form of R&D is rip off and deploy. So if there are good examples that you've seen, business practices, contracting strategies, technical strategies that we can uh, adopt, I'm, I'm all for it. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you saying that. Uh, my mother was a Catholic nun. She used to remind my brother, sister, and I that God gave us two ears, but only one mouth for a reason. So I appreciate your ability to listen. Um, they gave right. me two and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> all right, next we're going uh, to Aiden Quigley uh, from oh. Inside the Fence. Aiden. Hi, uh, thanks again for, for doing this. I really appreciate it. Hey, uh, I want to follow up a little bit on something you uh, mentioned earlier uh, about reducing unnecessary program costs. I'm wondering if you can expand on that. Uh, and you know, where could the Navy find uh, funding internally to increase the uh, shipbuilding budget? Yeah, so um, you know, one of the things we've been um, really focused on within the Navy, uh, and I'll channel a little bit Admiral Lusher, the Vice CNO, because he and I have been uh, teammates on this, is the notion of let's get real and then let's get better. Uh, and bureaucracies love to solve a problem before they fully understand it and pull levers to show that they're making activity, not necessarily always understanding, did those levers actually change the needle? And so we've been on a campaign of let's get real, let's really understand where's our cost, where's our spend. If I think of dollars, people, right, or time, fundamentally understand that so we can fix the things that matter the most, that will move the needle the most, and not confuse activity with outcome. And so the effort we did on the F-18 to bring the mission capable rate up from about 55% over the last 10 years to 80% was a lot less about buying new things or buying more parts. The old answer used to be, well, of course it's spares, let's buy more spares. When we really looked at it, it was, you know, how, many, how long has it taken us to do phase maintenance? Do we have the experience and the skill set balanced the right way? 
Do we understand the real maintenance degraders and have targeted programs to go after those? And what we found was a ruthless application of resources to the levers that had the most throw allowed us to get a much more rapid change uh, than all. So now we're using that philosophy. Do you know where you are? Let's get real. Let's not wish we can get ships out on time more often. Let's understand fundamentally how we're doing that. Then do we understand the key drivers? And then have we set targets uh, with the models that allow us to understand if we achieve our targets, we'll be, we'll be able to get there. Right. You know, bureaucracy in the case of the F-18, everybody who was supporting that program rated themselves at green. They also, well, I'm doing my part. I'm doing, so it was just coupling in these very complex processes that really gets at you. I think that's where you're seeing us really focus. If we can do that, that frees up resources, whether it's dollars or time or people that we can then apply to high priority activities. So as we get rid of stupid, I don't want to just do more stupid, right? I want to then take that resource and apply it to the highest priority activities so we can get scale and speed. Uh, so a lot of th thinking right now in the Department of the Navy on velocity of learning, you know, the Naval X for me is another way we spread learning out uh, and increase that collective uh, uh, velocity that's really what's going to allow us, I think, to free up the resources we need to then deliver the Navy the nation needs. I, I do think when you mention Naval X, I think it's very interesting uh, because we already had General, General Murray on yep. from uh, Army Futures Command, and we know obviously what uh, you know, the Air Force is doing with Air Force, et cetera. Um, let's talk about velocity. Let's talk about, I know I think Michael Dill had a question from JKN Arrow uh, on that. Michael? Yes, sir. It's a pleasure to be here, Jim. Great conference. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes, sir. Great. Okay. Uh, hello, Mr. Gertz. It's a Howdy. pleasure. Uh, I'm with GKN Aerospace. And uh, real quick, during the previous administration, particularly under the leadership of Ms. Ellen Lord, uh, the department was making a concerted effort to revise the acquisition process to deliver advanced technology to the warfighter faster, reduce the total cost of ownership, increase the competition, while deploying more interoperable and supportable systems. The revision of the 5000 series contributed to this effort, certainly. And to your knowledge, does the uh, current administration support this effort and wish to continue down this path? And if so, where are we in this regard? Yeah, awesome. Uh, uh, again, I think is maybe one of the only people that has a foot in each camp. Uh, I'm in a pretty good condition, I think, to comment on that. So I would certainly applaud uh, Secretary Lord and her team's effort um, and everybody over the last couple of years to get at the, the problem. And you know, a key term for me is being able to differentiate the work. Uh, you know, in the bureaucracies love to pick one way to do everything, which generally means it does everything poorly. It's kind of like, you know, a, a wood shop tool that can perform every function just not well. Uh, and so first, the concept of not all the work is the same, and then we should create a bunch of different pathways that can apply there. It was, a, it was a really sound concept. And I would say in this administration's doubling down on that. They understand the imperative. They understand uh, how important it is for us to get there. And so I see, uh, at least from that aspect, no slowdown. I think you may have uh, uh, ANS coming here. Yes, uh, yes sir. And, and certainly they can comment uh, from their notch. But from my notch, sitting in the services and speaking uh, specifically for the Navy and the Marine Corps, you know, we're doubling down. That's how you get scale and speed. You inspire and empower a workforce, you give them a wide variety of tools to pick from, and then you hold them accountable to pick the right tool for the right job. And, and so we are definitely doubling down on that. Um, and so if you don't see that, uh, james.gertz at navy.mil, send me a note. If you sense that we're slowing down, uh, give me a holler, and I'll put the 18-inch neck into play and, and help <laughs> yes, uh, encourage people. Well, it's really good. And I love your quote, let's get real, then let's get better. Yeah. I'm going to keep that one. Thanks, Michael. We appreciate it. Next, we're going to go to Richard Abbott from uh, Defense Daily. Richard. Hi. Yes. Thank you very much. Given the uh, skepticism from some members of Congress in retiring some ships um, on the earlier side, like the cruisers from their perspective, is the administration looking at changing the timelines on retiring cruisers and how to 
just generally balance those efforts on modernization and maintaining capability. Yeah, great question, good question, Richard. Um, I'll, uh, I won't talk in detail um, until the budget comes out. Uh, obviously, we're looking at what's that right balance uh, of keeping things while they're still useful, but not keeping things uh, to the point where they're not adding value uh, to the missions we see going, uh, going forward. Uh, and not falling in love with the product just because we have the product. Uh, it's got to show that it can be lethal uh, and add something to the fight. Uh, having said that, you know, we want to maximize uh, the return on investments made and, uh, and look to, to maximize those investments, and, and maybe in new and interesting ways. Uh, I'm sure the CNO will talk some with kind of his perspective from a warfighter lens. He's been outspoken on uh, things like LCS where there is a place for it. We just need to be creative in how do we uh, maximize that previous investment going forward. I think there is a point, and we, if we think of interpersonal lives, where that car you used to love, you know, I, it, for me, I'm a piano player, and I had a beautiful 110-year-old piano, but it was about 10 maintenance hours for every playing hour. And eventually, um, it's just not adding to the fight as, as you think about going forward. And so I turned a piano into a bar. That was a much better use for the piano. <laughs> and I got a new piano. And so that's where I think we're going to constantly, and, and it's a really hard thing to do, but back to this balance. We've got to constantly uh, be balancing. Because if we keep some stuff too long, it ties up not only the cost to sustain it, manpower, technical data, training centers. So this embedded cost of keeping a product too long uh, can be debilitating. Uh, now, it's up to us to show how we balance that from a warfighter lens, from an industrial base lens, uh, from an adaptability lens, and we should be held accountable to show how we balance that if we're going to make a move. Terrific. Next, we're going to go to uh, Megan Eckstein uh, from USNI. Megan? Hi. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you guys so much for taking my question. Hi, Megan. Hi, um, I want to tie together Rich's question and Aiden's question and just push a little further on this uh, issue of cost savings. Um, obviously, in your previous portfolio with RDA, you found ways to address um, acquisition and readiness for ships and aircraft. Um, in your new job, you have visibility into a much larger portfolio with everything the Navy does, whether it's personnel, um, education of the force, healthcare of the force. I mean, there's so many huge expenditures the Navy has. And I just wonder, I mean, in light of Congress being pretty unwilling to allow the Navy to get rid of these legacy ships right now, I mean, where else can you look to find significant savings and where can you kind of bring that process improvement that you had on the acquisition side to other pieces of the Navy budget? Yeah, great question. So kind of, as I said before, I'm positively discontent. And so I am always looking for opportunity to do things in a new way, a better way, a more uh, efficient way. We need to be cautious. We're not so efficient. We're brittle in that, you know, we've come up with a great idea that works only if we're perfect predictors of the future. But certainly we need to be relentless on kind of this get real and get better. Uh, at some point, you're kind of on the law of diminishing returns. And then, then it's a frank discussion of um, how much capability do you want and what's it going to cost to generate that capability. And so my first priority is maximizing the return for every tax dollar uh, the taxpayer gives me. Uh, and I will maximize that to whatever level they give me. And I will you know, push, push the enterprise from all elements. It's, we're in a unique opportunity in the Navy to have both Secretary Harker and myself, two very experienced folks, two institutionalists uh, here to go, you know, drive for those efficiencies and, and work that out. But there is a point when you can, um, you know, if you're going to get uh, additional outcomes, it's going to be an investment. And so what I'm dedicated to doing is ensuring I can, with confidence and credibility, uh, say that we have maximized the dollars we've been given. Uh, and then it's a decision for the dollars you're given in that output, is that enough? Or for the fight that you see going forward, uh, do, we, do we have to change the, uh, change the balance? Uh, again, I want to clean up my backyard before I talk about somebody else's backyard, and that's what we're really focused on. Uh, but ultimately, I think for the national decision makers, as they see uh, the world unfolding, they're going to have to decide what the naval force required is to achieve the outcomes. 
Uh, and then how that matches up to the budget will be something we'll have to work. I'm not waiting for that debate to try and take every dollar I can, every dollar, every uh, hour, uh, every person, and get it to maximum use. Because quite frankly, if we're going to be ready tonight, uh, I've got to do that tonight. I can't wait for a budget decision a year from now uh, to maximize the capability I can give the sailors and Marines today. No doubt we have to be ready to fight tonight uh, to keep our family safe here at home. Uh, next, we're going to go to uh, another Navy veteran, uh, Naval Captain uh, and Academy graduate, Mark uh, Vandroff uh, fin from Finken Terry. Is that D. Mark Vandroff? It is D. Mark. Okay. He owes me money. <laughs> yes, sir. I probably do owe you money. So it's uh, great to talk to you again, you uh, Hondo. Hey, Mark. Yeah. Hey, hey, Hondo. Great to talk to you again, sir. Um, a question. Uh, kind of a follow-up to what you said in your prepared remarks on unmanned systems. Um, if I get it, if I'm lucky enough to get a question, I think I'll, I'll ask Admiral Galinas about some of the technical aspects of unmanned. But for the non-technical aspects of unmanned, the, the concept of operation, rules of engagement, force protection, how do you man it? How do you craft a manned, trained, and equipped philosophy around a platform that is not itself manned? How quickly do you see the Navy moving out on the non-technical parts of that? And do you think that the, the parts that aren't the, the buying of the actual platform will be able to keep pace with the Navy's ability to actually go buy the platform? Will, they, will, the, will the support and the, the intellectual work be ready to, to support the technical advance? Yeah, great question, Mark, and uh, it's one that's weighed on my mind the last two years. You know, if I think back to my early SOCOM days, um, you know, when we were on the front end of the unmanned aerial kind of uh, activity in Iraq and Afghanistan, um, I got to the point where we could quickly outpace uh, employment and training and tactics and maintenance by procurement, and we got a little out of balance, and so, um, I'm, I'm encouraged by the Navy, the campaign plan and stuff. I was just out of Point Magoo, Point, uh, Point Manimi, uh, out there with the Devrons, that they're actually um, working on that right now and um, starting to think through all of those, where are we gonna base it, how are we gonna man it, how are we crew it. I was on one of our unmanned surface vehicles that's done you know, transits and talking to the, you know, what does autonomous uh, do in terms of algorithms, where does it have weaknesses, uh, and so I think uh, a year ago or two years ago, I would have said I'm uncomfortable that we've got those lined up and the right things in action. I would say I'm positively discontent right now. I'm positive that we, we have started the right motions. People are thinking about it. I'm discontent at speed and scale, and uh, that's just who I am. So uh, I think the next year or two or three, it'll be really transformative to work through some of those practical elements uh, and it will be more, um, it will be more, the speed and scale will be based more on that than the technical elements. We still have some technical elements to prove, uh, but speed and scale will be driven by uh, all the things you mentioned. And Thank I, you, sir. And I think the theme that you're talking about is being positively discontent. Yeah. So we like that sense of urgency. And Mark, we're going to go to your colleague now, John Lehman. Uh, John Lehman, uh, son of Bucks County. We're very proud of him. Uh, John, you're up. Well, good afternoon, gentlemen. It's great to uh, great to see you guys again, and, uh, albeit virtually. Um, Hondo, sir, you you, you mentioned uh, that you're trying to achieve the uh, alignment of accountability and responsibility, which you know I, I truly believe is absolutely fundamental and critical. Um, but how do you achieve that alignment in a system where program managers move every couple of years and don't ultimately have the authority to manage the risk? versus cost versus schedule equation, you know, most notably vis-a-vis -vis tech warrant holders. Yeah, I think so. I think the way we get after it, John, is move from a transactional view of the world to an integrated view of the world. Anywhere where I've seen innovation at scale and speed, if I think back to, you know, Air Force, uh, you know, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, you know, stealth jam, 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 if I think of SOCOM, it was where we broke down. It wasn't a requirements guy handed an acquisition gal a requirement, and then she ran a program and then handed it to the fleet. 
it was everybody was much more integrated. That's certainly my SOCOM experience. So what we're really trying to drive is a mindset, an outcome-based mindset, not a transactional mindset. And again, I, I view our success through the eyes of sailors and Marines, uh, and ultimately they don't care whose fault it was, they just want an output. Uh, and that's what we should all, that should always be our North Star. There's lots of stakeholders, there's lots of uh, constituents, but ultimately, uh, I view it in their eyes, and if we can all view that, and COVID, I think, helped us get away from having a little bit of a myopic view or a stovepipe view and much more of an outcome-based view, even between government and industry. Uh, that has allowed us, I think, uh, shows us the path. Now we've just got to have the courage uh, to stay on that path. If we can do that and we can measure from an outcome back to this get real, then get better, and get real and get better is in the ultimate customer's eyes, not a warrant holder's eyes or a PM's eyes or a programmer's eyes, uh, then, then I think uh, we will achieve the scale and uh, speed I'm talking about. Hey, Hondo, I will tell you, John Lehman was, was worked for SASC when I was going through Senate confirmation. Uh, and, and John, I appreciate your help uh, when I was going through that process. And, and your service. To, he to missed one. Nation. He let me go through, but you know everybody has a miss every once well, in a while. Well, you know, you, maybe guys stick together. So, <laughs> and and uh, I will tell you, you know, if I could just and Jim, I'll turn it over to you next. But go to go right ahead. What keeps you up at night? Um, not much keeps me up at night. What are maybe maybe what do I wake up thinking about? Right. I think about speed and scale. I think about resilience, and I think about adaptability. A challenge in a democracy generally is we're not going to take the first, we're going to not going to give the first punch. We're going to have to take the first punch. Right. And so if we focus too much on just pure efficiency for what we think is a perfect view of the future, right. we're likely to be wrong and then we're likely to create a really brittle um, solution. And brittleness doesn't stand up well to, you know, guessing wrong or or not thinking through all the, the different opportunities. And, and the competitor gets a vote. Uh, right. And then I, then I wake up you know, um, thinking about what opportunity have we missed and how do we think as hard about capturing opportunities as managing risk. Uh, that's probably what I wake up most of the day doing that. Ultimately, it gets to be a talent game. We hide around processes and org charts and regulations and stuff. It's really a talent match, so ultimately, uh, we need to think as hard about talent as we do about processes and programs. And that's candidly where I still think we have work to go in our combined industry uh, government team um, because we're still a little bit wrapped up in the how, not what talent is here. Because as I said, with great talent, the processes doesn't matter. With poor talent, the processes don't matter. Um, and so that's ultimately where I think we've got to continue to really press. Jim, want to ask the last question? Just, just the last question. Do you um, talking to kind of the wheat farmer in Oklahoma? What's, what's, what's the basic combat power, right? Why, why should the wheat farmer in Oklahoma care about the Navy? Number one, and then number two, in closing, um, do you think the American people as a whole, do you think they really understand the severity of the China threat? So, so I always get worried as the size of the military gets smaller and smaller that the military, if we're not careful, gets disconnected from its population. Yes, sir. Both in how we operate, the challenges we face, and in our view of a competitor. And so um, I worry about that. And that's something I know any of the other senior leaders here would say, is something we've got to continue to work upon as, as those numbers go down. Um, what I would say in terms of the Navy is, you know, 90 to 95 percent of world commerce happens on the sea. Most folks would probably guess that. They probably wouldn't guess 99 percent of the world's internet traffic is actually underwater. Yes, sir. And the cloud is actually underwater. Uh, and if you don't have forward presence and you don't have the joint force of which the Navy and Marine Corps is one large element, but not the only element, forward and present and engaged. Um, we're going to miss indications and warnings. We're going to cede territory uh, at way too low a price. Uh, and we are going to put ourselves in a condition where when we decide we want to be competitive, uh, it's too late. Uh, and so having a joint force that's out is present, uh, enables us to really understand what's going on, influence what's going on, be able to uh, suppress uh, some right. desire or actions of a competitor. 
that's why I think having the joint force uh, out and deployed present yes, is really important. As I said, a third of your Navy ships are out there sailing the seas. The Marine Corps has got 25,000 uh, Marines on the first island chain. Yes, sir. Uh, the joint force has a uh, similar kind of thing. So I don't think it's an us versus them between the joint compared. We have to have a joint force that's engaged and present yes, and connected to its people. And that's, uh, that's what I think is really important as we think through problems like this. That was, you have made the case to the wheat farmer, sir. Well done. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Thanks, guys. guys. Just give a round of applause to Hondo. Yeah. Thanks so much, Hondo. Appreciate it. And, and we'll we can be agree that uh, from my time at Fort Benning and Fort Bragg, two thirds of the earth is covered in water, one third is a drop zone. There we and go. We got to be there we go. Good. Good. So much. And we'll start. I, the, I feel like giving Jim a mosh pit check right yeah. now, but I would <laughs> embarrass him in yes, front of everybody. Sir. Well done, sir. Thank you. And we'll start again at uh, 315 with uh, General Brown.